to make ideal bread. Uh, it takes uh, takes discipline and focus to make ideal bread. Uh, it takes uh, clarity of intent. The band came out of a quote of Steve's that was uh, from an interview in the 70s where he said making making jazz is like being a baker and making the ideal bread because you have to wake up every day and do it again and every day you strive to make the best bread so some days the ideal bread is a uh, hollow bread uh, another day it might be rye um, another day it might actually just be uh, matzah um, might be kind of a thin day for, for bread that day I would say it's more a collection of ingredients that we used to create different different dishes each time we play. It takes a uh, sense of humor. <laughs> I guess if Josh were making ideal bread, if I was thinking Josh making ideal bread since it, since he is the, the sort of brainchild of the project, um, I would have to say a lot of dedication goes into it. Josh puts so much time and so much thought into really every element of the arrangement of these tunes. And then, the, probably the most important part is that um, making ideal bread requires uh, completely trusting your intuition, no matter how strange a place you might end up going to. And this is the book of, completed book of um, charts. These are things that are finished that are going on the record. My name is Josh Sinton. Uh, I live here in Brooklyn, New York. I am the leader of a band called Ideal Bread, uh, a band that's been going for about seven years now uh, that is composed of myself, a baritone saxophone, Kirk Knufke plays cornet, Adam Hopkins plays bass, and Toma Fujiwara plays drums. Every song that we do is a song that was written by the late great uh, soprano saxophone player Steve Lacey. We are preparing right now to record our third record, um, a rather large collection of songs, 26 of them to be exact. Uh, it is uh, a creative reworking, recomposing of all the material that Steve uh, recorded for the Sarava label back in uh, the 1970s. Um, five LPs that were collected together and, and reissued in the 1990s as uh, a box set, a three CD box set called Scratching the 70s. Our own unique take on this material uh, will be two CDs, much shorter versions and uh, much more concise versions of everything. And we are calling uh, this opus of ours, uh, Beating the Teens. This is actually the notebook of drafts of everything that's been in process. So you could see like this is, um, this was a very early edition of Lapis and a very early edition of Roba from a concert we did in 2010. Early version of Cryptosphere. There's different instructions and there's the Cryptosphere there. As you can see, this is, this is uh, why I prefer doing things on computer. I make much more legible things. Uh, what's unique about this project is that there's more, there's more, um, there's more arranging happening than we've done before. We've really taken our time working with it. We've really put our own spin on these compositions. We're really trying to bring a very personal approach to this music, um, while at the same time honoring the, the composer and the musician. In my mind, I hear, and I've, I've worked hard to, to clearly put in like a link there. There's a trajectory from Steve's original version through my ears and, and then through kind of my heart brain to another place. But if I'm gonna go through all this trouble of doing this, it really begs this question like, well, why not just write brand new material? Scratching the 70s is a three CD collection that uh, brought together five LPs that Steve recorded back in the 1970s, from 1971 to 1977. Um, these five LPs 
are a really unique look into the beginnings of a uh, compositional career. They document some of Steve's very first efforts as a composer, um, and it's kind of a fascinating glimpse into someone who is demonstrating for the world their learning curve as a composer. As such, some of the music is bears that mark, and it's maybe not as finished or polished as his later work, um, which is part of what I was drawn to in this material. Uh, there is a lot of open space for uh, Ideal Bread to insert its own uh, unique personality. In a nutshell, oh man, did Josh put this in a nutshell? And I guess that's, that's what I've been thinking a lot about with this record, is um, what does it mean to be a repertory man? What does it mean to do a cover? What does it mean to uh, reuse someone else's information? Um, what does it mean when we say, you know, just when I say like, okay, this band Ideal Bread, we're gonna play a Steve Lacey tune. What does, that mean? what does that mean? Like how far can I push that? There's always a conversation going on about what uh, what's happening behind the music. I've been playing with that word of play, of playing Steve Lacey uh, music. Um, there's also gonna be a wide variation in uh, the styles of uh, music on this next record. Underneath the surface, the big difference is uh, that I'm rewriting everything. Uh, up until now, my methodology has been pretty simple, which has been, uh, I've found songs of Steve's that I've liked, I've sat down and transcribed them, and then we would go and practice them. It's, it's clearly an extension of the work we've been doing as a band and of uh, getting together as a band to play uh, the music of Steve Lacey, and a real departure in that we're just being ourselves much more and worrying a lot less about whether or not we are playing playing things the way that Steve and uh, his band play things. Well, this is a baritone saxophone. Uh, contrary to some people's thoughts, it is not a bass. It is really the cello of the saxophone family and that's pretty literal. This, this instrument has the same exact range as a cello. I fell in love with saxophones because I just thought the keys on it were just amazing. I just thought it was like the coolest looking machine ever. It, it made me think of a musical version of, there used to be a board game called, uh, it's called Mousetrap. It would be like this kind of Rube Goldberg of a device where the marble would kind of go everywhere and you would see if you could trap the mouse. And I just thought this looked like that version of that where like if I press, you know, uh, if I press this key over here, it makes this, this thing flop open over here and you know, likewise if I press this thing here with my thumb, it makes this go like that. Yeah, the instrument's been through a lot and that's kind of why I fell in love with it. I just, um, I kind of looked at it and I just kind of knew no one was going to love the instrument like I was going to. Funny enough, I bought it to be my backup instrument, but as I kept playing it, and it was just kind of a cranky, tough instrument, has a very strange sound. So it doesn't sound like you walk your scales. And I mentioned this exercise because I'd seen the book before. And he literally meant do, 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 do. And he uh, he did that and then he looked at me, he's like, yeah, yeah, I really, really kind of regret. I got really impatient and uh, I started to, uh, eventually I had to start doing two notes per step. I just couldn't handle it. Like, oh, oh, well, how long did you do the one note per step? Oh, 20 years. <laughs> that was his notion of impatience. <laughs> he was a funny dude. This is the well-worn copy of Findings. In case it ever gets lost, people know who to return it to. Um, this is essentially the book that Steve Lacey wrote uh, about his methodologies and it includes charts of his music, um, also uh, photocopies of the originals and his very meticulous handwriting. He was very inspired by Stravinsky as far as his chart making. Um, and he wrote this book, he actually wrote this book for very practical reasons, which is he, um, for most of his career, did not want to teach. He did not want to give anyone a lesson. He lives over in, um, he lives over on Broadway, actually, in Soho. 
that guy. He's still around. Um, but he wrote this book because um, <clears throat> he did not want to give anyone lessons. So then after he got the book written, he could just say, well, just go and buy the book. I met Steve Lacey in 2002. Uh, Steve uh, had just moved back to the United States after being living abroad for 30 years, um, primarily in, uh, in uh, Paris. Um, he was returning to the U.S. He was al also had made the decision, decision that he wanted to be a teacher, which was a big shift for him, because up until then he really had been almost exclusively a performer and composer. What I like to say about Steve is Steve Lacey was um, the most unified human being I've ever met. By which I mean the way he talked, the way he walked down a hallway, um, the way he interacted with people was uh, startlingly pretty much the exact same way he played the saxophone. When he entered the room, I wasn't facing the door he entered from, but I could feel that he entered the room. And I, and I turned around and he was there. He was just, he had a presence and a magnitude that was really like superhuman. So. I studied with Steve for a year, learned an enormous amount. Steve Lacey wrote music that tended to end in periods or question marks. He did not write using ellipses. Didn't necessarily write using exclamation points sometimes, but often just very straight, uh, seemingly simple statements or questions. Uh, when I started the band, it didn't even start as a band. It just started as a series of que as a, really one question, which was, what's going on with this music? Um, Josh's dad actually uh, said to me after one concert, he loves Steve Lacey's music because it sounds like something you would just whistle while you're walking down the street, like something maybe you would not even think about, but you just start whistling. So there's these little fragment melodies in the music that just are like a little doodle or something. Every, I feel like everybody could grasp. So it just started as playing sessions with musicians here in New York. Um, and eventually it was just uh, Kirk and I and, and a bass player and we just kept working away and hacking away at his songs. But it started because I met Steve Lacey, the person, the human being, and he was just, uh, just bowled me over with who, who he was. What I really love about being a part of Ideal Bread for so long is the process of developing music together and really giving the music time to breathe and develop with each, with, each, with each rehearsal, with each performance. And that really just comes from each person in the band being a very incredibly defined uh, personal musician. They all have very much their own sound and it's such a pleasure to improvise and to play music with people who have such a clear-cut vision of what they're doing musically. Kurt Knufke has played with uh, people like um, um, Matt Wilson, Allison Miller, and Andrew D'Angelo, and Butch Morris, um, you know, studied with the great Ron Miles. He has a wealth of information about jazz, about the, um, about the world of uh, brass music. Um, uh, Toma Fujiwara, really incredible drummer, uh, a student of the great Alan Dawson, literally like was that was his drum teacher, um, has played again with a large variety of people, um, you know, with Anthony Braxton, with uh, Mary Halverson, um, you know, with his own bands, um, you know, and again, uh, I know for a fact a, a really wonderful guy um, knows. An immense amount about the about jazz music, creative music, um, and has a really e easygoing but disciplined approach to his instrument and to writing music. Adam Hopkins, a younger player, maybe not so well known, but is a student of Michael Formanek, um, you know, has uh, really, uh, despite his youth, accomplished a lot already. He started a uh, major improvisation series in his hometown of Baltimore, Maryland, which is still going to this day, called Out of Your Head. He's now branched out and since moving here, he started another series here. He writes music. Um, I play in a sextet, Haverchuk. Um, so he's a great composer. Um, incredible ability on bass, both uh, bowing and plucking the instrument. To me, personally, Josh is a, a very close friend, a very close musical associate of uh, this interview happened right after Josh played in my band. Um, so Josh is a, a close friend and very recently has become one of my closest music collaborators and one of the people in the world that I most enjoy making music with. Um, he's an amazing low reeds player. The most exciting thing for me is to play with these other three musicians. 
Um, they're musicians that I have a lot of respect for, not just for how they play, but for who they are as people. And we've, over the years, developed a lot of chemistry together. Um, and for me, the exciting part about music is when you get to that place with another musician where you have a telepathic rapport. And I feel like we have that with the members of the group. I think it's very important for people to support the project because I feel so positive about the music. I really want people to hear it. I really want uh, it to get out in the world. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. If we do not make enough money for this project, this record will not happen. Any amount that you can contribute to us, um, no matter how small, uh, really does uh, aid us enormously in achieving this dream. It's also really great to hear Steve Lacey's music. He is one of the masters, not only as an instrumentalist, but also as a composer. And his music needs to be heard more. I want to uh, encourage you to support us, um, not just because we need your help, uh, but because I want you to be a part of this. Um, you know, this started as just a very strange kind of uh, waking dream fantasy that I had a year and a half ago. Um, and I and Kirk and Toma and Adam have done a lot of work towards realizing this dream, uh, towards manifesting it. And uh, we're at the stage now where we need other people to dream it with us. And I know that you can be one of those dreamers. I'd like you to be one of those dreamers. Um, and I think you'd really enjoy it. Uh, and at the end of all of it, you can say that you were part of this and that uh, you are instrumental to making a, uh, a great record, a great record of the 21st century.